Our third speaker is Dr. Christine Berg, who is a consultant in cancer screening and a professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology and Molecular Radiation Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. It is a pleasure to be here today. I'm learning a lot and enjoying it, and I very much appreciate the opportunity the committee gave me to present today. I'm going to talk about lessons learned uh, from the conduct of a successful screening trial. Um, that's not the PLCO, that's the National Lung Screening Trial. Um, and I thought I would compare and contrast the PLCO with the National Lung Screening Trial. Um, I ran both of them and I learned quite a bit and happy to share some of my insights with you today. I am a consultant for a company that's developing algorithms from blood markers, none of which are, um, they're developing for ovarian cancer. My objectives today are to review the PLCO briefly and the ovarian cancer screening results to put them in context, contrast with the NLST, briefly um, discuss UK CTOX, which uh, Marty mentioned, and go over what I consider important design issues, important conduct issues, and next steps. The prostate lung colorectal and ovarian cancer screening trial started in 1993 with recruitment going to 2001 in 10 centers across the United States. The age criteria were originally 60 to 74, but had to be expanded due to what we know all should know is that it's harder to get the older people into clinical trials. And so in order to increase recruitment, the age um, was lowered. And screening uh, stopped in 2006. There's a lot of information associated with the trial and a lot of monitoring. This was the trial protocol. It was designed to be a multimodal uh, protocol. The thinking is that a patient goes to see their primary care or internist. They're not just their ovaries or their prostate. Um, they are, you know, they have many other um, potential ailments. And the thought was perhaps a screening trial that reflects several of the leading uh, cancers would help us evaluate them in a more realistic context. I think that was a great idea at the time. I think that um, the subsequent experience with the NLST, to my mind, showed that focusing on one single disease has efficiencies. And it, I think, is an, a, a preferred approach. One other thing I need to mention is that the PLCO and the NLST have biospecimen repositories attached to them. Um, Nico mentioned some of the studies coming out of PLCO with the lovely designed logo <laughs> from OCAC that I think are very important. It has really contributed substantively to the GWAS and genetics and biomarker our research field. And the NLST is doing likewise in any trial, I think, should have a biospecimen a component associated with it. The design for the ovarian portion of the study used CA-125 annually for six years with the cutoff of 35 uh, units. The population was all postmenopausal. You could have made an argument for a somewhat lower cutoff. Um, TVU was annually for four years. The technology with transvaginal ultrasound, I think, at the start of the trial was, was rather primitive. And I actually do agree with Dr. McIntosh that imaging is probably what we really should be focusing on as it can image all portions of the uh, female uh, tracked, and, but you need to make sure the imaging is mature. And then the question is, well, what does mature mean? Um, another problem with the PLCO is that at the end, it only had an 88% power to detect a 35% reduction in mortality. What we know from other sc cancer screening tests like mammography, um, PSA, and uh, low dose CT is that you're generally getting a 20 to 25% reduction in mortality. And I think this was overly optimistic for a disease like ovarian cancer that spreads rapidly from the time of inception. Um, I'm not pessimistic. I do think early detection can detect ovarian cancer at a point to alter the natural history, but it's gonna be in a small fraction of patients. Uh, the average follow-up in the PLCO for the ovarian arm was 12.54 years, which I think is a little longer than was needed. The randomized trial uh, randomized 78,000 women total. 
because um, THPSO is not only prevalent in the high-risk BRCA1 and 2 carriers, but in American women as a whole, um, recruitment was slow. And so women with ovaries were allowed in the trial to allow adequate recruitment to the colorectal and lung cancer arm. And so we ended up with 34,000 women in the intervention arm and 34,000 women in the control arm who had intact ovaries. This affects power. Here are the results that were in JAMA. You can see with the um, left hand uh, graph that in the intervention arm, we saw more cancer. So overdiagnosis probably does occur in ovarian cancer as well. And then in terms of mortality, there was a non-significant difference between the two groups. Um, whether the trial could have been truncated and reported like at seven or eight years is a debatable question. And one I think that needs to be taken into account when designing a, a subsequent study is how long does it really need to be. Now, in terms of the National Lung Screening Trial, when we first discussed the design of this, um, we brought a statistician of some renown, Sir Richard Pito, to give us some advice. He wasn't a knight then. Uh, he was in the twilight of his years. <laughs> so um, he provided some advice to us. And what he told me was, Christine, what you're trying to do with designing a trial like this is like Napoleon marching on Moscow. It will never be done. <laughs> and so um, we designed it and we conducted it. And um, I'm very proud that we took it to a successful conclusion. But it's complex and it's very difficult and it's also expensive. I'm going to be bringing up expense a number of times. Let me just tell you what the National Lung Screening Trial cost. It was $256 million from the time of inception to uh, essentially when we stopped collecting um, data in the trial as a whole, which was at the end of uh, 2009. So it's a lot of money. That cost comes from recruitment issues and then also the imaging technology, which tends to be more expensive than uh, biomarkers. The trial was a uh, large size, but still lower than what we had for women in the ovarian arm of the PLCO. But we had a 90% power to detect a 20% difference in lung cancer mortality and follow-up of about 6.5 years. This was because uh, that we enrolled high-risk people the uh, estimated risk was from the Mayo Lung Project, uh, four cases per thousand enrolled in the study per year, as opposed to the risk in the general ovarian, in the general postmenopausal um, population of women of one in 2,500 cases of ovarian cancer, so several uh, times higher. Our results showed a 20% uh, decline in mortality. We had lung cancer deaths of 356 um, over the 6.4 years, compared to 443 in the chest x-ray arm, compared to in a larger uh, trial, 118 ovarian cancers in the intervention arm with 100 in the control. So um, the, you need for an ovarian cancer study in an average risk population, a very large sample size. The UK uh, CTAC study, um, enrolled from 2001 to 2006, screened until 2011, followed until this past December. Results are expected perhaps by the uh, end of 2015. Um, Stephen, um, actually Ian Jacobs reported at SGO um, that there's some evidence of a little more early stage disease in the screen group, but you'll have to wait for the mortality as to what kind of impact that will have. There's also an ongoing UK familial ovarian cancer screening study. I think the results of these studies, particularly UK CTOX, need to be uh, incorporated into any cancer screening study for ovarian cancer if you're going to go forward. And BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers, um, that's been spoken about a lot today. Um, the cohort from Toronto had a nice paper in JCO. Uh, recently, the ovarian cancer uh, adjusted hazard rate was uh, 0 0.2. 
I do not see any way that a screening modality is going to result in an 80% reduction in mortality. I, I, I don't think that's, we're, we're seeing 20 to 25% reductions with cancer screening. And so I think risk reducing salpingo oophorectomy is here to stay in the genetic uh, carriers. One other point I want to make is that overall mortality uh, was 0.31. It was mentioned earlier that there's a concern about cardiovascular risk in these women. And I think this is reassuring that it's not manifesting in an increase in uh, mortality. Most of this reduction is due to ovarian cancer and breast cancer reduction uh, in mortality. Um, so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on population-based screening. Um, I share some of Marty's pessimism. Um, is, it, is it going to be worth doing? given the low population prevalence and the associated uh, risks of uh, screening. How large should a trial be done? What are the performance characteristics and modalities and trial conduct challenges? One thing I want to draw to this audience's attention, this is the paper Nika was on, um, published two years ago, is that at the time the Women's Health Initiative results were released, you then noticed a further decline in ovarian cancer incidence. This was also similar. The decline in breast cancer incidence was more marked, but there was also a decline in ovarian cancer incidence, which is uh, reassuring. Um, but what a comment I would like to make is I think we should be looking at um, the use of replacement hormones in women who undergo um, risk reduction salpingo oophorectomy and studying long-term uh, effects. Heart disease, um, primary peritoneal carcinoma, is that the reason those rat or mice that had their ovaries left in had more primary peritoneal carcinoma was the estrogen plus progesterone. I think we really need to be looking at that and study what those long-term effects of replacement hormones are and not just assume um, you have to protect against cardiovascular vascular mortality. A design challenge I've mentioned is the uh, low um, population incidence, four per thousand per year in the NLST. Risk models, uh, Nico mentioned, I'll discuss one briefly. We need to, um, if we do a study, it has to be large and uh, adequately powered, like 200,000 people in the UK CTOX, which would be expensive and hard to do in the US. We had very slow recruitment in the PLCO and uh, much rapid recruitment in uh, the NLST over 20 months, which really helped uh, trial outcomes. A risk prediction model um, that looks at all ovarian cancers and breast and endometrial cancer was developed by uh, Ruth Pfeiffer um, and uh, colleagues in DCG. I think it'd be nice to go back and look at a more nuanced no um, model looking at uh, histologic subtypes based on the information that uh, Nico presented. But to point out that the AUC at, um, was 0 0.59. This is similar to the Gale model, but not as good as what we see with the NLST criteria applied to a different cohort, the PLCO. So you could use it to help enroll fewer patients. Are you going to get all the representative across all the subtypes? I think those are really critical issues uh, going forward if you use a risk model to enroll. Other design challenges are your screening modalities. Um, the biomarkers may not pick up, up all cancers, different subtypes, so you'll need a panel. The imaging, I think, will do a better job of that. Even with imaging, though, uh, an NLST subset analysis that was done um, showed that the uh, effect was better in adenocarcinomas and not so good, if even harmful in squamous cell carcinomas, presumably because these are centrally located lesions, are harder to detect with a low-dose technique. The adenocarcinomas are in the periphery and surrounded by lung parenchyma, which is easier to pick up a lesion. Um, what are the performance characteristics of the chosen test? Was CA-125 really good enough to launch a large study? Um, in the handout, I, I put a reference in for our design parameters, and um, you're, you can look at that and make up your own mind. I think the TVU technology was a little bit too early. 
any test, even with good sensitivity and good specificity, will miss a few cancers and is going to have a problem with false positives. I think the NPR report on false positives in mammography this morning uh, by Richard Knox, um, I haven't read the original health affairs paper. It's always easier to comment when you only listen to NPR. I, I thought that it overemphasized the um, false positive problem. But in ovarian cancer, I think the false positive problem is a real problem because because at the end of the day, you frequently have to do an invasive laparoscopic or lapar laparotomy procedure, and I think that has um, more risks than a breast biopsy. Um, compliance is also an issue. We had pretty good compliance in the PLCO for ovarian cancer and very little contamination because CA125 and TVU hadn't really been adopted by the community. Um, I think if there's a good technology out there that's really promising, that's inexpensive, that has a low side effect prof profile and is FDA approved, I think women who are concerned are going to embrace it widely in, in the U.S. and think they're going to have a problem with uh, contamination in any controlled trial. In the NLST, we didn't see that um, very much. We had only 4.3% contamination in the chest X-ray arm. I think um, that people who smoke are different from the worried, well, ovarian cancer concerned women who most likely doesn't smoke. <laughs> and so you're going to have a different kind of behavior, and you need to take that into account. I would like to bring up the um, PSA in the PLCO. There was 34% PSA um, done prior to entry. And in both arms, in the control arm, there was 40% contamination the fifth first year and rose, so this is annual, to 52% in the sixth year. The intervention arm compliance was only 85%. I think this difference between the intervention and the control arm made the prostate arm of the PLCO trial uninterpretable. Conduct tri uh, challenges also include the false positives, and I think you need to really monitor the um, mor morbidity and mortality of your interventions in a screening trial and also in uh, practice. And this is where we, you know, we did this regularly with the NLST. We were constantly going over our um, morbidities. And I think it's really critically important for um, fallopian tube and ovarian cancer screening where you have an interior organ that um, is a challenge to get to. And so I think non-invasive evaluation as often as possible um, needs to be done. So what if you get what you want, then what? This was a problem I never considered with the NLST. You know, we do the trial and then, you know, we'll start screening. And so um, the question is, who do you screen? Um, both the U.S. Task Force and Medicare only used the NLST criteria, extended the age to 77 for Medicare and 80 for the task force. I don't think that's the right thing to do. There's a, a low risk group, even within the NLST. Um, Martin Tamamagi and I and others have a paper um, this past December in PLOS Medicine with a model that Martin's developed. You can screen 9% um, fewer people and detect 12.4% uh, more cancers. And so I think you need to think about this as to who you bring into the trial and is that going to be important going forward. So. In conclusion, I think there's a lot of issues that we um, need to be looking at. I think the GWAS or other added may improve patient selection, but it's going to increase cost and slow down recruitment because patients will have to come in for blood tests and then go back and wait. And I think the trial has to be done. If it's going to be done, it has to be a good a sample size. But I think the most important thing is preliminary data with um, screening and imaging, I think, would be the best after a series of biomarkers. And we need to wait to see what UKC talks shows. So thank you very much for your attention. And I want to thank the participants who gave of themselves for these trials. <laughs>